Hello and welcome to the first video session of the introduction to English linguistics. In this session I would like to raise a very general question, namely the question, what is linguistics? What have you gotten into? Well, linguistics is the science of language. Science, that's a fancy word for knowledge. So linguistics represents what we as researchers know about language. Well, what do we know about language? Linguists like to disagree with each other, but they also agree on a number of things. And in this video, I would like to talk about seven things that linguists agree on. Right, let's start. The first thing that linguists agree on is that language is uniquely human. You could say it's what makes us human. So only humans have it, and all humans have it. Every child learns language. Of course, you know, with serious sicknesses and malformations, there may be the occasional exception, but otherwise every child learns language. Also, every human society, every human culture uses language for communication. There are no cultures in which people go, me Tarzan, you Jane. It doesn't happen. Every human society has what you might call a complex, fully developed language. Um, these languages are very different from one another. They differ extremely, but then again, they have certain features in common. So, for instance, all languages have words that you might call pronouns, things like I and you. <clears throat> um, another thing that makes language uniquely human is that there are certain parts of the human brain that handle language, that are responsible for the processing and production of language. How do we know that? Well, mainly from stroke patients, from you know, the, those unlucky people who have had parts of their brain uh, being damaged. And uh, in these people, sometimes language, aspects of language break down selectively. So some parts of language still work properly, others not so much. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a last point, and really the main point, is that human language differs from animal communication system. The next video that uh, I'll be doing will contrast human language and different animal communication systems. And with this in mind, I would like you to meet Alex the parrot. Here he is. Okay, let's watch this. That's right, say better. You're right, say better. That's right, key, how many? How many? How many key? No. You're right. What's different? What's different? Color. That's right, and what color bigger? What color bigger? Good birdie. Okay, so Alex can do quite remarkable things. He can distinguish different colors, he can count, he can uh, determine which one of the two keys is bigger, and he can express all that in English. Quite remarkable. Nonetheless, I would like to argue that this is genuinely and qualitatively different from the language that, say, a um, two-year-old is using. Okay, There are qualitative differences, and we will talk about these in the next session. Moving on to the second thing that linguists agree on. Linguists agree that language is a system of regularities, a system of rules. Um, every language has a system for constructing things like syllables, words, and sentences. You can't just string words together. You can't just string sounds together in any way you fancy. Every language regular uh, has, has certain regularities with regard to this and these regularities you might call the grammar of the language okay grammar syntactically speaking the way in which you form a proper sentence the way in which you string words together to form phrases and sentences but also the way in which you can form new words and the way in which uh, you construct syllables Knowing a language then means that you know these rules. Not that you've been ever taught these rules, okay? You've learned them inductively, 
through the process of language acquisition. And even though you may have learned some of these rules in schools as prescriptive rules, um, really the knowledge that you need to talk is subconscious. You don't have to have explicit knowledge of what a preposition is, a, uh, a complement clause, a relative clause. All of this is really expert knowledge. Uh, the knowledge that you need to talk is subconscious with the curious effect that quite often you can't readily explain what you know. You can't really explain why does this sound better in English than this, okay? Um, young children, for instance, at quite a young age, they use relative clauses, but many adult speakers cannot define what a relative clause is. So, go to Wikipedia, check out what a relative clause is. Um, linguists then try to figure out what these subconscious rules are. Let me give you one example of a subconscious rule. Um, this, is a fam this is famous stuff. So Here uh, we have a picture of a blue thing and um, let me tell you it's a wug. Now there's another one. There are two of them. There are two wugs. Right, exactly. Um, moving on. This is a gutch. Now there's another one. There are two of them. There are two gutches. Right, gutches. And this is a niz. Now there's another one. There are two of them. Two nizzes. Yeah, you said it. And this is a heath. Uh, if we have another one, we have two heaths. Right. Now it's probably the case that just a minute ago, you hadn't heard the words uh, wug, heaf, or gutch. But still, you know something about them. You know how to form the word that signifies two wugs, two heafs, and two gutches. And uh, you will notice that, um, well, with gutches, you form the plural in a way that you say is at the end of gutch. With heaths, you uh, produce what's called a voiceless s. Heaths, it's a sort of hissing noise. And with wugs, you produce a voiced s, a softer, gentler sound. Wugs. All right. And you did that because you have internalized a rule, a regularity of English, which concerns how words that sound differently are pluralized. Moving on to a third point uh, of agreement between linguists. All linguists agree that language is creative. The regularities that we have, the elements that we have, the, the, the words and the sounds, um, they are finite. There are only so and so many of them. But with these rules and with the elements, you can create an infinite number of new expressions. The example that's usually given is, you know, take the first book that um, you see in your room or wherever you are on the bus. Um, well, on the bus you might not see a book, <laughs> but you might see something else that's written. You know, point your finger uh, to the first sentence that comes across you and, um, you know, check it out. And chances are that this sentence you have never encountered before. Okay, on the bus that's less likely, but still, take the book, take the book. So um, this means that language enables you to say and think things that you have never heard before or never thought before. Yeah, so language is a tool that has an infinite set of possibilities from a finite set of rules and elements. Let me give you a, an example of, of really, really creative language use. Um, this is an excerpt from the famous poem, the, the Jabberwocky. I'll, I'll read it to you, uh, these first uh, stanzas here. Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves and the momy wraths outgrabe. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. 
beware the Jabba bird and shun the Frumius Bandersnatch. Yeah, the guy was crazy. But the poem is kind of cool, yeah? Um, what makes it cool um, from the perspective of a linguist is that there are words in there that are complete nonsense. Like, you know, they're not proper words, but nonetheless, nonetheless, you can say something about them. For instance, um, take the second line. Um, so the slithy toves did gyre and gimbal in the wave. Gyre and gimbal, you will recognize, are, are meant to be verbs. And you kind of know that they are verbs. And maybe you can even form a mental image of what it was that the uh, slithy toves were doing. They were there sort of gyring and gimbling um, in the wave. I don't know what a wave is. But I know it's a noun, and that's quite amazing. So, um, here, of course, it's the context that lets you know um, that gyre and gimbal are verbs, and wave is meant to be a noun. Okay, creative language use. A fourth point that is going to be important in the second part of the course, mostly, um, is that language is social. <clears throat> well, language being used for communication, it's sort of obvious that there's a social dimension to language, but of course there's also something that's maybe less, less trivial about this uh, statement that language is social. Every language varies according to region, where you are, speaker identity, who you are, and the situation, who you're with, okay? So nobody talks the same all the time. Everybody has a certain repertoire and talks differently in different situations. So the same person speaks differently to their parents, to their friends, to their kids, to someone from Spain. Yeah, you get the picture. Um, this may strike you as a little trivial, but really it runs deep. It's a deep issue uh, because language defines communities. The way I talk to someone else says something about our relationship, our mutual relationship. <clears throat> uh, language shapes identity, okay? Um, and different language varieties carry prestige or stigma. It's not nice to ju pass judgment, uh, but we constantly do, okay? If someone talks in a way that we can't stand, we can't stand that person, yeah? If someone talks in a way that I don't like, I don't like anything else about that person. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Here's one thing that I'd like to show you. This is Jar Jar Binks. And, um, I have a little sound bite of Jar Jar Binks talking. We should die in here! <laughs> Relax, we're not in trouble yet. What yet? Monsters out there, leaking in here, all sinking and no power? When are you so taking we so in trouble? Yeah. Okay. Ura, so say out on here for them. Stop it. Okay, um, Jar Jar Binks, you will notice talks in a way that differs from the speech of Qui-Gon Jinn, the Jedi master that, you know, that they're currently in the submarine and trying to escape from a big monster. I think it's episode four. Yeah, so, and Jar Jar Bink, we saw die in here, and Qui-Gon Jinn, in a distinguished British accent, says, relax, we're not in trouble yet. And Jar Jar replies in, in his accent, and says, what yet? Monsters out there? And so on and so forth. Okay, we can speculate as to why a respected Jedi Master talks in a distinguished British voice and a funny character that brings about comic relief is talking in a pseudo-creole, you know, Jafakian accent. But fact remains, these two talk differently, and the differences say something. Okay, language 
is social. Um, coming to the fifth point, language always changes. Change is the natural state of any living language, much to the dismay of people who want to keep the status quo or even return to a former state of the language. So people all across the centuries seem to think that language used to be much better than it is currently because these days the young people are messing it up. They're always on Facebook, they're twittering and, and sending text messages and grammar is totally going out of the window. Terrible stuff. However, um, sober observation yields that languages are in fact changing all the time. Um, in fact, the changes that have happened in the past are so great and so vast that we have trouble understanding language, English language, that was produced 500, 600, 700 years ago. Okay. Um, examples for such changes, well, between Middle and Early Modern English, there was something that's called the Great Vowel Shift. We'll get to that later in this um, uh, series. So the word that's now being pro uh, pronounced house, it was pronounced hoose. Um, right now there is a similarly um, great vowel shift underway in the northern cities of the uh, United States. So a word that is pronounced God in, in British English um, being pronounced God in more traditional uh, U.S. English is pronounced Gad in northern cities U.S. English. Vowels changing. Um, another aspect of language change is that languages evolve in quite stunningly systematic ways across languages. So um, here I've given you three examples. I'm going to send you an email. Je vais te donner quelques conseils um, and uh, a Dutch example that I'm not going to read. And in all of these we have a word meaning go that has evolved into a marker of future time. Not a coincidence, that happens in a lot of languages. Okay. Um, I said that uh, we have trouble understanding English that has been produced a couple hundred years ago. Here's an example. Uh, this is the Lord's Prayer in Old English. Let me play it to you. Vader ure, through the art on Herfenum, see the name of Yahal God, Torbacuna Thina Richa. Ye wertha thin willa on e othan swa swa on e othanum. Or on e ye dagwam likan chlaf siula o... That will do. Thank you. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, you have no trouble reading the modern English version. Our Father in Heaven, may your name be kept holy, let your kingdom come, and so on and so forth. Um, Already when we go to early modern English, which is not that far away, historically speaking, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Art. That's not a form we're using anymore, is it? Um, when we're getting to Middle English, things start getting stranger still. Uh, <clears throat> and with Old English, you really need a course in order to be able to, to read what's on the page. Moving on to the sixth point. Uh, languages are very, very different from one another, but they are related. There are relations between languages, genetic relations. Languages um, have common ancestors. Okay, So English and German, for instance, have a common ancestor that goes by the name of West Germanic. The West Germanic languages um, go back to a common source and this common source, West Germanic, goes back even further to an ancestor language by the name of Proto-Germanic. So in Proto-Germanic we have <coughs> descendants um, that do not only comprise West Germanic but also North 
Germanic, East Germanic. Right. Um, so, languages have a history, they have parents, they have children. Um, and this metaphor also means that languages can die. Vandalic, for instance, that was an East Germanic language that, uh, due to historical circumstance, was spoken in northern Portugal and Spain, yeah, quite far away from, from East Germany, for that matter. Um, so this language died out in the 6th century. Um, and, conversely, new languages can be born. Um, and an example that I'd like to give here is the one of uh, Nicaraguan Sign Language, which is a sign language that was developed by deaf children in western Nicaragua in the 1970s and 80s. Okay. <clears throat> in discussions of relations between languages, quite often you will see tree diagrams like, like these ones here, uh, which is a part of the Proto-Indo-European language family. You see it has several branches, uh, Indo-Iranian, Hellenic, Celtic, Italic, Baltoslavic, and well there's the Germanic branch. There are more branches. Uh, this is just a snippet. <clears throat> and Germanic branches into North Germanic, West Germanic, and uh, well, East Germanic is not on here because uh, it's extinct. Right. The seventh point. This is a fun one. Um, I mentioned initially there are no languages in which uh, people go, me, Tarzan, you, Jane. They're not there. Um, there really are no primitive languages. Um, it stands to reason, though, that, that language must have somehow evolved out of a simpler system of communication. <clears throat> there are a number of theories, some of which you can take seriously, some of which not so much. Um, but one that is currently uh, discussed is that language sort of piggybacked on gesture as a system of communication. So the idea that first you have gestures and uh, then people start making sounds that accompany gestures and then once these sounds are being conventionally associated with the thing that uh, the gesture used to denote well you can just have the sounds and get rid of the gesture. You use the hands for something else. Okay, nobody knows whether this actually happened this way but it seems a plausible enough idea that gesture was sort of the kickstarter for, for a language. Now, um, linguists have studied languages all around the globe, but they have not found a language that is not yet fully developed, a Tarzan Jane type language. Um, and those of you who might think, well, aren't there some hunter-gatherer societies that use really, really simple languages or aren't those hunter-gatherer languages somehow less complex than some European language and well sorry um, it seems that languages of indigenous populations are just as complex if not more complex than the languages that you are familiar with um, the last point on the slide uh, is the so-called uh, equal complexity hypothesis that linguists used to uh, champion for quite a while now. Uh, simplicity in one area of grammar, say in, in word endings, uh, it tends to be balanced by complexity in another area of grammar, say in word order. Okay, um, there's a current discussion going on whether this equal complexity hypothesis really is completely watertight. There may be languages that are more complex than others. Um, well, I'll maybe get into this, I'll go into this in a bit more detail at a later stage in this course. But for now, uh, take it from me, there are no primitive languages. Um, all languages that we know of are fully fledged and um, 
much more complex than um, animal communication systems. Here's a nice quote that I couldn't resist uh, to have here, um, made by Edward Sapir, famous linguist, uh, and he said, all attempts to connect particular types of linguistic morphology with certain correlated stages of cultural development are vain. Rightly understood, such correlations are rubbish. The merest coup d'oeil verifies a theoretical argument on the point. Both simple and complex types of language of an indefinite number of varieties may be found spoken at any desired level of cultural advance. When it comes to linguistic form, Plato walks with the Macedonian swineherd, Confucius with the head-hunting savage of Assam. Well, nice. Okay, coming to an end. Uh, what do linguists know? Well, we know that language is uniquely human. We know that language is social. We know that language changes all the time. We know that language is a system of subconscious regularities, that you know. We know that language is creative, that it has a finite amount of elements and regularities with which, however, we can express an infinite number of ideas. We know that languages are related and we know that there are no primitive languages. Okay, with that I'd like to leave you and I'll see you next week.